And welcome to A Celebration of Reading, A Vision of Literacy for All. A special program brought to you by the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation and made possible through the generosity of KPRC2, Phillips 66, Hushang and Shala Ensuri, Quan X Foundation, and many other generous supporters. Featuring best-selling authors Peter Baker and Susan Glasser, President George W. Bush, Ellen Hildebrand, Matthew McConaughey, and Mark Sullivan. With special performances by vocalists Dez and John Holliday. And special remarks from Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation co-founders and co-chairs Neil and Maria Bush. Now, please welcome our host, Emmy Award-winning evening news anchor, Dominique Saxa. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a celebration of reading. This event is hosted annually by the Bush family for the past 27 years. We do have an incredible program for you tonight, during which you're going to hear from some of our nation's most celebrated authors, and you're going to learn about the important mission and the impact of the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. The late First Lady Barbara Bush championed the literacy cause for most of her life. She advocated for reading as a fundamental right, and she was instrumental in increasing access to vital literacy programs for adults and families all across our country. Mrs. Bush believed that everybody deserves an equal opportunity to realize the American dream and to thrive in their life. She also had this vision for literacy for all lives through her family and her namesake foundations. To share more, please welcome my friends, Neil and Maria Bush to the stage, founders and chairs of the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. Mom and dad are surely smiling down on us tonight, delighted that together we are advancing the critical mission of the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. The pandemic has had a devastating impact on our nation and the Houston community. Too many children have fallen behind academically, and the systems that support their well-being struggle to meet the growing demand of services and resources. And too many adults have fallen out of the workforce and lack basic literacy skills to participate fully in our economy and society. We must create a sense of urgency around these issues. Undoubtedly, the work of the foundation to expand reading, tutoring, and summer literacy programs to equip underserved children with books to read at home, to empower parents with the skills to support their child's reading success at home, and to, to boost adult literacy rates are more important now than ever. If you're not already a volunteer or haven't donated to the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation, we invite you to visit our website to learn more and join us in our quest to change and save lives through literacy. Together, we can ensure a brighter future and a better life for everyone who calls Houston home. And now, on with the show. Tonight is a celebration, a celebration of the power of reading and the authors who impact our lives through their books. Every year we look far and wide to secure authors for a celebration of reading who would meet mom's high expectations. And Neil and I are confident we have exceeded her high expectations tonight. We have an outstanding lineup of authors. And our first author, also known as 43 and um, Barbara Bush's favorite son. <laughs> Sorry. That's not in the script. <laughs> He's written a number of bestsellers, including books about his years as president, about the life of his father, and after tapping into his inner Rembrandt, he released Portraits of Courage, a collection of oral paintings and stories honoring our nation's wounded warriors. His latest book, Out of Many, One, is a compilation of portraits and stories of 43 of America's immigrants. Please welcome the number one New York Times bestseller as of today. <laughs> Welcome, the 43rd President of the United States, my brother, the second favorite son of Barbara Bush, <laughs> President George W. Bush. All 
Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, if Mother were alive, she'd say to Neil, lose the beard. Uh, speaking about Mother, uh, so I get a phone call. I'm in Dallas, and the guy says, your mother's about to die. And I said, oh, we, we, we all kind of knew that. And I said, let me speak to her if she can talk. She said, yeah, she can talk. And I said, Mother, I'm just calling to let you know how much I love you, and you've been a fabulous mother. And she said, George, I love you too, and you're my favorite son. <laughs> On the phone. <laughs> uh, I still hear her on a uh, regular basis, and I'm confident. She's saying, get up to Houston and make this literacy event as good as you can make it. And I said, all right, Mom, I will. Uh, I'm really happy to have seen James A. Baker and Susan. This is a remarkable Houston citizen and a great American. He was, uh, he made the world a difference. The old boy turned 91 yesterday. And Baker, you don't look a day over 90. So I've written this book. It all came about because, uh, I was discouraged by the language surrounding immigration. I didn't think it really reflected the soul of our nation. And I think as a result of the anger uh, surrounding this issue, that Americans may have lost sight of the beauty of immigration, what it means to our soul and our nation and our economy. And so Ken Melman, who was my campaign manager, uh, in 2004, was down to visit in Dallas, and he said, we need your voice. And I said, you're not going to have it, <laughs> because I don't think it's good for a former president to second-guess his successors. I think it undermines the institution of the presidency, and one of the great strengths of America is the office of president is more important than the occupants. But he said, uh, why don't you paint some? And being a budding artist, I said, it's a damn good idea. And now I find myself opining about the issue of immigration through my art. And one of the first uh, people I painted was Paula Rendon. And by the way, the book's got famous people in it. That's to enhance sales. And, uh, <laughs> uh, for example, the astro killer Albert Pujols. Uh, but the first one I painted was somebody nobody knows except our family, Paola Rendon. Each painting has got a story attached to it. Uh, and so what I want to do is read the story of Paola. On a rainy day in 1959, the doorbell rang at 5525 Briar Drive in Houston. I was 13 years old. When I answered the door, a tiny woman huddled in a raincoat was standing there carrying a very small suitcase. She seemed scared and timidly said, Hola, I'm Paula. I didn't realize at the time what a life-changing moment it would be for me, Paula, and our families. Over the next six decades, Paula became an integral part of our family. She was like a second mother to my siblings and me. The first immigrant I really knew showed me how hard-working, family-oriented newcomers add to the cultural fabric, economic strength, and patriotic spirit of our country. I had three young brothers, Jeb, Neil, and Marvin, and a newborn sister, Daro. My parents had decided they needed help with our growing family. Well, mostly my brothers and me, who were responsible for turning our mother's hair white. <laughs> An agency referred them to Paula Hernandez Rendon, who was living in Cuernavaca, Mexico. She had a small house with a dirt floor. Her husband had recently passed away, and she was coming to Texas to better the lives of her three children. In doing so, she bettered our lives. All of us have vivid memories of Paola. She was complaining, uncomplaining, hardworking, and a most loving influence in our lives, Brother Neil says. I always thought I was her favorite. Kind of a current theme, isn't it? 
because she had a twinkle in her eye when she called me by her nickname for me, Ojos Azules, Blue Eyes. Marvin remembers staying up late watching reruns of Bonanza and, and Gunsmoke with her, Paola learning to speak English, Marvin learning how to be a cowboy. <laughs> when my parents' car would pull up in the driveway, she'd throw me off her lap and yell, Get in bed! She let us throw away our vegetables without getting caught, Jeb said. <laughs> she secretly gave me her green sauce recipe, which I use today. Dara remembers sitting in the kitchen watching Paola cook homemade tortillas or sew dresses that Dara would wear to grade school. They were beautifully done, even though the patterns Mom picked out were ridiculous. There was nothing more gratifying than being in the kitchen when those fresh tortillas were coming off the grill, Marv remembers. When I was six, she would feed me a big flour tortilla with lots of butter and salt. And we were all convinced these provided medicinal benefits. <laughs> Paola's devotion to our family was second only to her devotion to her own children. She saved money to bring Alicia, Teresa, and Luis to the United States. They all became proud U.S. citizens. When Dad was elected President Paola, a Mexican-American immigrant who had risen from poverty, moved into the White House with him and Mom. I don't think Dad would have become president without Paola Rendon, Marvin says. Her presence gave Dad and Mom the comfort to travel and build the relationships that were essential to Dad's career successes. She spent the summers working at Walker's Point, our family's home in Kennebunkport, Maine. Mom posted rules on the bedroom doors for the grandkids. Number seven was, ask Paula if you can help. At the end of every season, Mom gave out bonuses to the local high school students who worked on the property. Coleman LaPointe, one of my dad's aides, recently told us that Paula would secretly slip $500 to each of the summer lads on top of whatever Mom gave them. We never had any idea. That was typical of Paola. Mother and Dad set up a generous retirement plan for Paola, but she had become such an important part of our family, and vice versa, that she refused to retire. <laughs> At age 95, she continued to help Mom oversee the household. As Darrow puts it, Paola did more bossing than working in her later years, <laughs> but all that mattered to us was that she was there. She was a constant, Darrow says. We were so lucky to have her. Who stays for 56 years? Especially after all the grief my brothers gave her. <laughs> when I set out to work on this book, I narrowed the vast pool of worthy subjects by deciding to write about first-generation immigrants who are still alive. Sadly, Paola died in February 2020 at the age of 97, shortly after I finished painting her. Four generations of Mexican-American family members attended her funeral. On that day, Alicia Ramirez, one of her 36 great-great-grandchildren, gave a touching eulogy. This incredible woman went from making hurraches, sandals, with my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, to owning her own tortillera, and to finally accomplishing one of her earliest aspirations when she came to the United States to work for the Bush family. This opportunity allowed her to bring her children to the United States. She loved kids and flowers. She was of strong Catholic faith. She never forgot where she came from, and she always remembered to give back to people less fortunate than her. Recuerda a tus paisanos. Remember your countrymen, is what she would always say. She could never stand a dirty home. She made that uh sound when there was something she did not like or approve of. And she let you know if you were overweight. <laughs> Darrow says that she probably cried more at Paola's funeral than she did at her mom's. Not that I love mom less, Darrow says, but Paola was really a part of our family. In a way, she was the last of our family to pass from that generation, and we will miss her. We learned a lot from Paola. She taught us what it means to work hard. She taught us what it means to sacrifice for one's family. She taught us to be grateful to immigrants who keep the American dream alive by realizing it and passing it along to new generations of diligent 
determined United States citizens. And now I get to bring back Dominique because she's going to ask me some difficult questions. <laughs> Thank you. What a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I loved your story about Paola. Uh, I'm going to take two other ones real quick. I know sure. you didn't ask, but that way. <laughs> the floor is yours. That way you don't have to work. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> But I want to. So there's there's two people in here. Uh, one one woman from uh, Ru uh, Rwanda. She lives in Houston. And another kid from Austin. He was from Burundi. And both of them during the genocide uh, went through unbelievable horror. So the Rwanda lady uh, saw her father hacked to death by Hutu villagers. Her mother dies. She's in the jungle with her uh, young daughter uh, sisters. Uh, picked up by Hutus and sexually abused at the age of 13 years old. She gets back into Kigali, uh, gets her uh, sister placed in um, in foster homes. She's too old for a foster home, so she ends up with a family. that The guy has a work visa here in the United States. He, he brings her and his family to Missouri. He sexually abuses her. She ends up in uh, Washington State the University. And uh, if you were to hear this woman speak, you'll be shocked at how uh, sweet her heart is. She is full of total forgiveness. It's unbelievable. You know, my cynical mind can't quite wrap around the fact that this woman has forgiven everybody who has abused her. And, and, and that's the kind of citizenry that will help this nation heal from the divisive anger that we've been dealing with in the past. The other guy is the guy that was pictures up there, Gilbert. Uh, I got to know him because Jenna, has, uh, when she was a senior at University of Texas, uh, used to get up on Saturday mornings and run with Gilbert, and I figured, you know, this guy's got some magic. Uh, uh, Gilbert was in Burundi. Uh, he was a, a world-class high school runner. Uh, Hutu classmates of him lock him and other Tutsi classmates in a schoolhouse and burns it down. And Gilbert has 30% of his body burned. And he, and he runs to a hospital. He gets, that's Gilbert, gets saved. Uh, and uh, he ends up at Abilene Christian on a track scholarship. He, he meets a guy who has a running store in Austin, Run Tex. And Gilbert goes there and starts a running club, Gilbert's Gazelles. But the, the interesting thing about Gilbert, though, is he raises money for clean water in Burundi. And one of the lessons of the immigrants in this book is that many have been helped, but that then causes uh, them to want to help others. Mm. And so the compassion of America is enhanced by people who come to our... Not only is the economic vitality enhanced, not only is the patriotic spirit enhanced, but the desire to help a neighbor in need is enhanced. And that's a common thread throughout all the stories. Yeah. Mr. President, let's talk about the art. There's some really neat pictures of you in this book, in your studio, doing your work. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the process. I mean, do you look at a photograph of a person? Do you yeah. have them sit for I'm you? I'm looking at you. See, I could mix that you, paint. Really? Pink. There's a lot of it going on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not saying that, of course. <laughs> it's all right, I did. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I look at photos. You don't have time for somebody just to sit there. Yeah. Uh, but the key thing is to know the subject you're painting. Mm. And so I knew their stories going into it. And uh, the only weird one is Arnold Schwarzenegger's painting. Uh, it's a pretty cool painting because it's got a lot of paint on it. And it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, there it is. And that, uh, that's, he insisted I use that, that picture. Mm. Because that's the day he got sworn in as a U.S. citizen. And he was dressed wow. as Uncle Sam. And... Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, a lot of people wouldn't put green, but I, just, I felt like putting green. And uh, and it seems to work pretty well. He liked it. Uh, matter of fact, we did a Zoom call with Arnold the other day to kind of promote this book. And right before we started, he brought his pet donkey, Lulu, into his living room. So the donkey was on camera with Arnold and this Zoom thing. And uh guy's got a unique sense of humor. <laughs> Mr. President, this is my copy. Would you indulge me? Yeah. Thank you. I don't know how to spell your first name, though. I'll tell you. All you have to do, all you have to do yeah, is yeah. just say to you, my favorite Houston newscaster. Yeah. D-O-M-I-N. <laughs> yeah. 
IQ, yeah. UE. I'm going on way too long, but this is a Houstonian as well. So there's a guy in this book named Tony George Bush. Mm -hmm. No, truly, that's his name. Yep. It wasn't his name when he was born. He was born in Baghdad. He was an interpreter for our troops. The soldiers he worked with gave him Tony because he liked frosted flakes. <laughs> and he came to the United States on the visa policy we put in place. Oh. And they said, what will you be called? And he said, Tony George Bush. <laughs> so I had to paint the guy. Anybody that's stupid needs to paint. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for having me. Oh, what a treat. Thank you. Okay, so our next author has been called the Queen of Beach Reads. She has written 26 novels. She is a number one New York Times bestseller. Her next book called Golden Girl is set to be released in June. Please welcome Ellen Hildebrand. The title of my very brief talk is called Beach Books Rock. Let me see if I can persuade you. So I was raised in a blended family of five children. And every summer, my father and my stepmother would take us to Cape Cod for the month of July. They rented a sort of ramshackle cottage on a sandy lane that led down to the beach. And this place was really funky. It had a sagging screened-in porch that was sort of hanging off the side and it had sand between the floorboards, and it had furniture that looked and smelled like it had been sat on in wet bathing suits for 50 years. And we all loved it. And we had certain rules that we had to follow while we were on the Cape. We were not allowed to shower inside. We had to use the outdoor shower. We were not allowed to eat inside. We took breakfast, lunch, and dinner on the picnic table out on the back deck. If it was sunny, it was a beach day, and the five of us would sling our towels around our necks and march down the sandy lane to the beach where we would proceed to stay for eight hours. And my parents would slather us with copper tone number four. <laughs> that was a foam in those days. And we would come home from the beach at the end of the day, like radioactively glowing. And my grandmother would say, oh, you all look so healthy. We used to treat the sunset like it was a Broadway show. We would get our seats early, and then we would clap as the sun sank into the blue horizon. For dinner, we would either grill out back, or we would go for fried clams, soft serve ice cream. We'd play miniature golf. My father used to wake us up twice in the middle of the night. The first time, we would all go down to the beach in our pajamas and look at the stars. And the second time, he would light the candles in the dining room and we would play a game of Midnight Uno. It was an idyllic way to grow up by anyone's standards. And then, in November, after my 16th summer, my father was killed in a plane crash. And those summers came to an end. I spent my 17th summer working in a factory that made Halloween costumes. So I stapled clown hats to cardboard forms... I made ghoul kits. That was like the fake blood and the glow-in-the-dark vampire teeth. And because it was 1986, I folded Rambo headbands. And as I did this eight hours a day, five days a week, bemoaning my reversal of fortune, I made myself a promise. And I told myself that no matter what I did with my life, I would find a way to spend every summer at the beach. So between the summer of 1986 and... April of 2021, a lot happened, and uh, I will give you the cliff note, the extreme cliff note version. Um, I went to Johns Hopkins undergrad as a creative writing major, and so as you might imagine, I was something of a unicorn, because <laughs> all of my friends were biomedical engineers and pre-med, and as you can probably guess, my job was to go to the bar and save the seats while everyone else finished studying. <laughs> um, a few years later, I was lucky enough to attend the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop. <laughs> Go Hawks. Um, I moved to Nantucket year-round, and I wrote 27 novels.
A few years ago, I was doing an interview with a magazine called New England Home, and the writer asked me a question that I had never been asked before. She asked me, who do you write your novels for? And I gave it some thought, and I realized that I have written every single one of my novels for that heartbroken 17-year-old girl folding the Rambo headbands. Because if it doesn't sound too surreal, what I needed that summer was an Ellen Hildebrand novel. I needed something that was going to pluck me out of my misery and take me to the beach. So, as you might imagine, I have a lot of very privileged readers. I have readers who buy my novels, and then they go and they get their farm fresh tomatoes, and they get their beach stickers. I have just as many, if not more, readers who, for whatever reason, cannot experience a classic American summer. Maybe they're spending the summer in the chemo chair, Maybe they have an elderly parent that they're caring for. Or maybe they just don't have the time or the resources to go on vacation. This past year, I heard from countless readers who said that reading my books got them through quarantine. The most meaningful letter I received was from a nurse at the Mount Nittany Health Center in State College, Pennsylvania. I had sent that hospital a box of books because my best friend's father was being treated there and he would ultimately succumb to COVID. This nurse wrote that her days were steeped in loss and in the agonizing grief of the patient's families, but that when she got home at night, my books gave her a glimmer of sunshine. So if I had to answer the question again, who do you write your books for in the year 2021, I would say, I write it for everyone who has compromised or challenging circumstances because more than anything, I want all of my readers to feel like they spend every summer at the beach. Thank you. Here at the Adult Education Center, they've changed my life, and that's what I'm here to do as well, to change other lives. I'm a role model, of course, to my children. So my goal was to prove that no matter what age you are, you can still go back and you know, pursue your dreams. We are extremely grateful for the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. One of our favorite initiatives that they funded was our Literacy for Mothers, where it was helping mothers actually persist through education while they balance work and life. I am mom of three sons and one girl. Before I'm learning English, I needed help with my husband. He had to go with me to the banks or to the store. And now I'm proud of me because I can't do it by myself. It's so hard just to make that phone call, just to walk in that door and say, I need help, whether it be for literacy, obtaining my, your GED, learning English. For me, the blueprint gives a lot of folk, little boys and girls, similar to me, who have grandparents or mothers who have no literacy skills or very low literacy skills, the opportunity to break the cycle. An alarming one in three adults in Harris County is functionally illiterate. The Mayor's Office for Adult Literacy and the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation have been working with community leaders across our city to develop a strategic plan. The plan would enable more adults like Beatrice and Olivia to have access to high quality literacy programs and services I invite you to learn more about Houston's Adult Literacy Blueprint. Together, we can change lives and ensure that Houston thrives. Okay, so let's bring up our next author. His riveting novel, Beneath a Scarlet Sky, was the most sold and read book on Amazon. Joining us now to speak about Beneath and how it actually led to his new novel, which is called The Last Green Valley, please welcome acclaimed author Mark Sullivan. Every story I write these days has to have four components. It must be inherently moving. It must be inherently inspiring, healing, and potentially transformative to the readers. So why? You have to look back about 15 years um, in February of 2006, I had the lowest moment of my life. Uh, my little brother, who was also my best friend, had drunk himself to death. And <clears throat> I'd written a book that bombed in the United States. 
that I loved, but it bombed. And um, my uh, wife and I were involved in this long, lingering business dispute that took us to the point of personal bankruptcy. And I was driving down a snowy highway in Montana where I live, and I realized I was worth more dead than alive. And I considered driving into a bridge abutment so that my wife and kids could collect on the insurance. I didn't do it because I love my wife and I love my kids. Uh, but I got to the Costco parking lot of all pl places, and uh, I was as rattled as I've ever been in my entire life. And I put the head, my head on the steering wheel, and I begged God and the universe for a story, something that would give me meaning and purpose. So I go home, and my wife, uh, Betsy, has no idea that I've gone through this crisis and that I'm at this low point. And uh, she says, you have to go to the Robinsons for a dinner party tonight. And I'm like, a dinner party? I said, I, there's no way I'm going to a dinner party. And she said, you have to. We've, we've canceled three times. Go for an hour and excuse yourself. So I go to this dinner party, and 20 minutes into it, this perfect stranger starts telling me this story of a 17-year-old Italian boy who leads Jews escaping Nazi-occupied Italy over the Alps into Switzerland in the winter of 1943 and 44. And then, through a series of remarkable circumstances, the kid becomes a spy inside the German high command. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, like, no, we would, have, we would have heard this story. That's impossible. And he says, no, I, I, I think he's alive. I, he's alive. I mean, how old is he? And he, well, he's 78 years old. So I track down this man's phone number, and I call him in Italy, and he speaks great English. And I said, I'd love to come to Italy to hear your war story. And he said, well, why would you want to do that? And I said, because you're a hero. And he said, no, no, I, I, I'm no hero. I'm more of a coward. And now all of a sudden, all my story senses are going up. My antennas are there. And six weeks later, I get off a plane in Milan, and there's this big strapping man and uh, introduces himself, and he's gregarious and funny. I go on this three-week odyssey with Pino Lella, and he tells me this, the story of his last two years in the war. And he also teaches me a lot about grief and tragedy and life. And I return from Italy a fundamentally different person. I'm no longer looking at what's dark and bleak in my life. I'm looking at miracles because they're everywhere around me. Uh, and I finish the story, and I'm really proud of it because people are going to know about Pino. And I have no idea that the book will go on to be translated into 37 languages and will be a, soon to be a seven-part miniseries starring Spider-Man, Tom Holland, right? Thank you. As wonderful as the 37 languages and the miniseries and all the acclaim is, the thing that I value most are the letters I get from people from all over the world who are either depressed or suicidal when they pick up the book and they write me that it changes their lives. And I don't think I've ever had anything more fulfilling than that. So I'm looking for another story like that, something that is inherently going to move readers. And I finally find it, of all places, in uh, the Noontime Rotary in Bozeman, Montana. <laughs> so I give this talk about Pinolella, and this gentleman comes up to me afterwards, and he's a local retired dentist, and he says, do you know the Martells? And I said, you mean the construction people? There's a big construction company in Bozeman, in Northern Rockies. And he says, yeah. He said, the entire time I was reading Beneath the Scarlet Sky, all I could think of was the story of how they came to America. You have to hear it. So a couple days later, I put Bill Martell's address into my navigator, and it's like two miles from my house. And I driving along, and it tells me to take a left into this old, older neighborhood. And I'm getting this really funky feeling. And I can't quite figure it out until I get out in Bill's driveway, and I realize I can't be 250 yards from the dinner party where I heard Pino Lella's story, right? And by the way, my agent tells me to go afterwards, go knock on every door in that neighborhood. You, you've got a tremendous career in front of you, right? Um, <laughs> But anyway, I go, and within 10 minutes of Bill starting to tell the story of how his parents came to America, I'm sitting in the front of my seat, 
And within an hour, I know I'm telling this because it's hitting every single one of these criteria. And basically, the story is about a family of refugees in a covered wagon pulled by horses who are trying to outrun the Soviet Red Army while under the protection of Nazi SS officers who were involved in the Holocaust. Right. And that's what I said when I first hear it. But as the story begins to come out and begins, I begin to hear more about it, I hear something extraordinary. I hear a story about the power of the human spirit. I hear a story about resilience. I hear a story about people who would do anything to get freedom. So I really appreciated what uh, President Bush had to say about immigration because, in fact, the book is dedicated to the immigrants who renew this country's soul every day. And the, the Martells go through this remarkable odyssey. They go in from Ukraine, where it starts, in a rural village in Ukraine, and it goes all the way across Europe because it turns out that the Martells are ethnic Germans whose families, ancestors, had immigrated to the Ukraine at the request of Catherine the Great. They uh, had this remarkable life for over a century until the Bolshevik Revolution, in which case they were thrown off their land, they were starved, they were sent to gulags, they were murdered, and everything is horrible for 20 years until Germany invades. And they say, do you want your land back? And they said, well, of course we want our land back. And they go back, and they have about 18 months. And then Stalin counterattacks, and they drive the Germans into retreat. And unbeknownst to the uh, Martels, they're being protected because Heinrich Himmler, the architect of the final solution, believes that the Martels and the 120,000 other ethnic Germans who have been living for over 100 years largely in isolation have the purest Aryan blood left on earth, and he wants them protected. And they find this out during the course of the story in which you can't believe what happens to them. They get caught in tank battles. They're in bombardments. They're caught between two armies that are trying to move across Europe. And at the same time, they're forced to reckon with their own actions at the beginning of the invasion of the Holocaust And they are forced to finally find out why they're being protected. The remarkable thing about it is that they never lose their humanity, not once in the entire process. In fact, they become bigger humans. They see opportunity at every uh, turn, and they see America when they get here for what it is. And they end up going to Montana, of all places, because they had a sponsor, and Literally, from that point forward, everything the Martells touch turns to gold. And as Adeline said in an interview on the 4th of July about 20 years ago, this is only possible in America. Thank you. Atherton Elementary School is a beacon to our community. We have wonderful families. We have awesome students, even though they have their challenges financially, sometimes socially, emotionally. We do what we can as a school to help them become better students. One of our students, Caden Yates, is an excellent example of how important it is to have a parent to read with you as a toddler. Reading is fundamental. Reading is like the key to a door. It's a passion for Caden. Like, I get excited when he wants to read or even once he he wants to tell me about what happened in the book. I read for 30 minutes every day. I think it's important to have books at home so I can practice. Atherton, about five years ago, was an IR campus. IR is improvement required. And we're proud to say we came off of IR in one year with the help of the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. Our students are provided books through the My Home Library and summer support through Camp Adventure. I received six books that I've chose from the My Home Library, and those are free books and free learning. I have a little brother, Matthew. He is in pre-K and also goes to Atherton Elementary. I read to him often to make sure he gets it too. 
sometimes it amazes me when Matthew just picks up the book and he might not know all the words yet, but he's excited, you know, what it can do for him. I believe books will play an extraordinary part in Caden's life. He always tells me he wants to be a doctor or a president, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hope for both. Every child deserves the chance to become a competent and confident reader and to realize his or her fullest potential in life. The Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation is committed to increasing childhood literacy rates across our city. Please join us in our quest to change lives and to make Houston a city filled with readers. Coming up next are a husband and wife duo. They are revered journalists and authors who have spent years writing about the intersection of politics and the world. Their recent biography, The Man Who Ran Washington, centers on the life and times of legendary White House Chief of Staff and Secretary of State James A. Baker III. Please welcome Susan Glasser and Peter Baker. You know, surprising for me to learn that this is the first biography on Secretary Baker. Was that shocking to you, considering what a distinguished career in politics and service? Well, it was shocking, exactly right. I want to thank, by the way, the Bush family and the foundation for including us here tonight. I want to thank Secretary Baker and Mrs. Baker, who came out for this event tonight. We wouldn't obviously have a book uh, if it wasn't for them. Uh, and I, I, uh, I want to thank uh, Julie, who put this whole thing on. I, you're right. That was the reason we decided to do this book. This, you know, Secretaries of State are uh, written about in biographies all the time. Mm -hmm. Many of them have done very little by comparison to a Secretary of State who was there at the end of the Cold War, reunified Germany, uh, led the coalition for the Gulf War, helped uh, uh, bring a peace uh, to Europe in a way after 40 years of conflict. And nobody had done that. And if that were the only thing he had done, that would be one thing. But as you say, he was also White House Chief of Staff for Reagan. Yep. He was the Secretary of Treasury who rewrote the entire tax code. He ran five presidential campaigns. Imagine Henry Kissinger and Karl Rove wrapped into one, right? <laughs> you know, somebody who does both policy and politics. Yeah. And he's from Houston. That's right. <laughs> Bonus. Bonus. <laughs> That's right. Susan, talk about what it was like working with Secretary Baker throughout this process. Well, I'll tell you, I have to say, it's, it's wonderful that he's here tonight because the truth of the matter is when real biographers found out that our subject was not only around but uh, very engaged, they said, well, well, we're sorry. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> and especially, I must add, because Secretary Baker, uh, in his time in Washington, I think was particularly skilled at the, the care and feeding of journalists and uh, is also, uh, I think, with some justification, reputed to be probably one of the best negotiators sure. that we've had in Washington in a long time. So you can imagine that Peter and I felt a little intimidated and a little outmatched. But I have to tell you that, uh, you know, one thing I would advise anyone considering writing a biography is it's really great when your subject has already written two of his own books. Uh, <laughs> you had some research material. Yes. I, the other thing I recommend is, uh, you know, if he's going to be in fantastic shape and in his 80s, also a good moment to get somebody when they no longer, uh, you know, are as worried about the, the day in and day out. And so Peter and I were very lucky. And if he did get the better of us in negotiating, well, we didn't notice. So... <laughs> <laughs> I had the pleasure of interviewing Secretary Baker. It was prior to a Baker Institute fundraiser at Rice University. And we talked about his unique and special relationship with former President George H.W. Bush. This was a friendship that stood the test of time. I'm sure you have touched upon that extensively, but have you also seen any other relationship like that in politics, either past or present? There are really no precedents for it. I mean, right. you're right about that. We were lucky enough to interview President Bush 41 and Mrs. Bush, Mrs. Barra Bush for the book before they passed. And President Bush uh, referred to their friendship as akin to brothers, right? And you cannot think, I think, of another president and secretary of state in history who had that kind of a relationship, a relationship that was not built on politics, but was built on friendship first, built on the tennis courts here in Houston, right? Built on families getting together for Thanksgiving and cocktails at Christmas, not based on politics 
or that sort of thing. The closest thing I can think of would maybe be John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, who were brothers, obviously, and yes. Robert Kennedy was in the cabinet. But this is a very unique situation in American history, and it gives a Secretary of State unique power to negotiate and represent America in the world if people know back home the president is, is, is with him. And what Secretary Baker always said to us is, you're not going to find any space between me and my president. Hmm. Interesting. And what would you add to that, Susan? Well, you know, I think to me that the book is in part the story of this unique relationship. And what I was struck by was that at key moments, they both acted in some ways to save each other, right? You know, it's not a, friendship is not a one-way street. Uh, You know, brothers or cousins or whatever you want to call it is not a one-way street either. And certainly, uh, Secretary Baker, you know, he's a very unlikely political figure. Uh, and growing up here in Houston, he came from a family that was pretty adamantly opposed uh, to getting involved in politics. And of course, Bush came from a very political family, and his own father had been a senator. And I think that it was politics and uh, George H.W. Bush's friendship with Baker that really enabled him to get out of this big crisis in his life after his first wife had passed away. And so, you know, one of the things about Jim Baker is that, you know, he is also the world's most successful mid-career change. Uh, He gives hope to all of you who are thinking of doing something different in your 40s. Uh, Because he never even came to Washington uh, until he was really in his 40s. And that was because of George Bush. But the truth is, is that Baker, there have been a lot of people who brought their friends to Washington. Uh, and that's not necessarily a model that's good for business or good for the government of the country. Baker, of course, was very, very successful in Washington. And there were moments in time, I think, when he made George Bush's career. I mean, arguably, uh, you know, he contributed to Bush becoming president in a key way. Uh, and I go to this crisis in their relationship, actually, in the spring of 1980, when the presidential primaries weren't working out for George Bush. Uh, and he just wasn't winning. And Jim Baker did something which is really hard for any staffer, especially if he's also your best friend. And he said, you know, George, we're losing. We have to pull out. Ronald Reagan is winning. And there was this was a real, I think, crisis moment. Uh, Peter and I were just reminiscing about this. George Bush was on the plane back here for the crisis meeting, writing down what, I will not quit, I will not quit, I will not quit, I will never give up. Uh, well, Jim Baker and others persuaded him that now is the time. And it's because of that, arguably, that George Bush became vice president and then president, not to mention uh, Jim Baker ultimately becoming secretary of state. Right. You both have talked about so many highlights of his distinguished career. What do you both feel will be his legacy? Well, I think that the legacy that he would like to have, and I think that most people will remember, is, is somebody who made things happen, who made things work. You know, when we we had multiple interviews with him over the years. We were lucky to interview him here in Houston at his home uh, with Mrs. Baker at his office, and, and we interviewed him in Washington. But I remember going with him to his ranch in Wyoming, uh, and we spent a weekend with him there to understand where he comes from. And he's as much a Wyoming rancher as he is a Houstonian, uh, I think, in his, in, his, in, his, in his blood. And he talked about how frustrated, this is even before Trump, this is during Obama, so it's not partisan. And he talked about how frustrated he was that people just didn't get stuff done, that all they were doing was squabbling and acting and, you know, talking out without actually accomplishing anything. And I think that one thing that Secretary Baker stands for is having accomplished things. And I think that's, again, as Susan says, kind of the contrast with today's Washington, where often it feels like, anyway, it's about settling scores and setting up the next election. Yeah. And Susan, what would you add to that? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Secretary Baker wanted to be remembered and seen as a statesman and not just a political handler, but it was that savvy sense of politics on progressively bigger and bigger stages uh, that really made him what he was. Every single person in Washington, they said, oh, you're doing a book about Jim Baker? They wanted to know the secret of his success. And for Democrats as well as Republicans, he's still considered the gold standard in so many of those jobs today. And there's not a White House chief of staff who hasn't called Jim Baker for advice. And let me tell you, they must not have listened very well because (laughs) we've had a lot of them since then. (laughs) Well, the secret sauce is written in the pages of your book, The Man Who Ran Washington. What a pleasure to talk to you both and to have the man sitting right here. Thank you. Thank you both so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As you can see, the spotlight is on Secretary Baker and his wife, Susan, here with us tonight. It's an honor. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. 
Okay, so our last author tonight is one I had the pleasure to interview via Zoom, of course. He's an Academy Award-winning Best Actor. He is a college professor, a philanthropist, and now he can add best-selling author to that list. This lifelong Texan continues to pave his own path thanks to the green lights all along the way. I had a chance to sit down with Matthew McConaughey recently to discuss his new book, Green Lights, and here's what he had to say. You say this is a love letter to life, and you wrote this at age 50 in the desert. What compelled you to want to write a love letter to life now? Yeah, you know, I didn't know it was going to be a love letter to life when I sat down to write it. Mm. What I did was finally got the courage to go look at 36 years of writings and journals that I'd been keeping, which took a lot of courage because I was scared to do that. I was scared of embarrassment. I was scared of guilt. I was scared of shame. Um, I was scared of seeing the arrogant little SOB that I know I've been in times in the past. And when I went back, finally got the courage to go look at my journals, I saw all those things and I was all those things. But as I put it together, I looked at it and I was like, wow, it is a love letter to, to life. And that doesn't mean it's all a Hallmark card. That doesn't mean it's, it, it, it's, it's a love letter for all my failures and foibles and stumbles as well. And I noticed how all of those red and yellow lights where I failed, oh, they actually lent to, they were hidden green lights in those. They lent to helping me evolve as a man, helping me find more quality in life and understand what I stood for, what I stood against, being wrong many times to then help define what was right. Have you heard any feedback from readers about maybe people who are stuck in those yellows and reds and, and what's your advice for them? I have, I have heard a lot. And you know, somebody brought up a couple of months ago something that stuck with me, which is the art much of the time in our life is what do we do at the yellow light? Mm -hmm. Because you got your choice there. Mm -hmm. Do I slow down, give myself a red, sit still, which we need to do sometimes in life. We run into a caution. We need to stop. We got to deal with this. But sometimes we got to do the opposite. Oh, I see a caution light. You know what? I'm not giving this crisis credit. I'm putting the pedal to the metal and I'm blowing through this yellow light. If we stop at every yellow light, well then we dwell on our, we become victims. We become victimized by our victimhood. We mm -hmm. stack up these problems and it gets heavy and we dwell. But if we blow through every yellow light, we don't evolve. We don't grow up. We don't change. We don't, our life doesn't become more, have more quality as we get older. So what do we do with that yellow light? Sometimes we got to stop and take pause, dwell on it. Sometimes we need to step on the gas and, and, and blow through it. Reading your book, one of the things I also love is just your boyish nature and the craziness, this wild, adventurous spirit that you have. And so I'm curious as a parent, you know, some things are taught, some things are biological. You know, in the McConaughey household, have, have some of your children adopted this adventurous spirit of yours? Yes. And what's that um, like as a parent? Well, you know, it's each, I have three children, so it's a little different with each one. They are all three risk takers in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, the eldest is a big thinker. He sits back and he measures and he stays out of the fray. And you don't think he's a risk taker, but boy, once he makes up his mind and understands the situation, he goes in with a single mindedness that is, makes me drop my jaw. The, the middle one is like the adventure of greet the world. Let's go. I want to go to Switzerland to boarding school tomorrow. Wait, whoa, you're 11. You know what I'm like? And I'm like, wow, I love that you're like not mm -hmm. afraid of the world. Go. You want to go fill your passport now. Right. The youngest one is the is the more literal daredevil. You know, bye-bye, look. Look over there and he's hanging from a tree limb and he's got to swing about five feet over to land on top of the doghouse that has an aluminum top at an angle. And you're like, oh, <laughs> don't know about that. And he pulls it off, yeah. usually. Now, you know, as parents, we have to... It, it's kids don't know aren't afraid of heights until they fall from the tree sure and what is that level how high is that tree limb we let them climb before we go hey buddy come on come on come on down it's it's i'm constantly trying to me measure that limb we're mm -hmm. like you know no let them go yeah. go ahead see how far from the house you want to go walking into the woods go mm -hmm. go and then when you go hey come on back 
come on down from the tree. That's you're about 40 feet up there. You know, come on down. Yeah. You know, this ties in nicely to outlaw logic that you define a lot in your book. My mom's with us now. She's 89 mm -hmm. and she's the queen of the outlaw logic. I mean, she is the, you know, when that story with like that poem that I wrote. <laughs> yeah, allegedly. <laughs> that was oh, great. Yeah, yeah. Do you believe it? Yeah. Do you understand it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, then it's yours. Right. That, what, what? Okay. Well, actually, <laughs> it's plagiarism, but you understand it, therefore it's yours. Right. So she's the queen of relativity. You know, I have the pleasure of getting to talk to you today for the celebration of reading event taking place here in Houston. So let's talk about how important literacy is. My children love to read. Mm. And that makes Camille and I so happy, um, especially in this last year with all the quarantining and the time and, and the time where we've had the, the frontier has not been a physical frontier. It's been a mental frontier. And through books, I've seen my children travel the world, yes. travel ages, travel centuries and where they went through a book or maybe because they physically couldn't go have the experience themselves. Um, so they're getting a lot of culture out of, out of, out of reading, reading good stories, sure. travel. It is. It's travel of time, space, and place, and it really is transporting. And I think you have effectively done that in your book. I hope you all enjoyed our authors today. What an amazing and distinguished group. So now we get to move on to the entertainment. We've got two powerhouse vocalists to bring on stage, both of whom earn spots in the finale of NBC season 19 of The Voice, singing together for the very first time and accompanied by Ernest Walker singers. Please welcome Houston's own John Holiday and Dez. I want to invite all of you. Sing it on your feet if you want to. And clap your hands. Clap your hands. You know really hey. When I wake up in the morning, Lord, one light has my eyes, and something without a warning, Lord, weighs heavy on my mind. Oh, oh, oh.